My name is Dr. Amanda DeMarzo, and today we will be discussing different obstacles providers face when processing prescriptions. This will include some conversation on buy-in bill and peer-to-peer. We aim to discuss some of the pressure points on the system as it currently exists and how we can collaborate to make the system a bit easier. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the National Board of Prior Authorization Specialists, the National Board of Prior Authorization Specialists is an affiliate of ACMA. We are a global organization focused on establishing benchmarks of excellence and training for the life science and healthcare industries. We aim to set the standard of excellence through certification of professionals as prior authorization certified specialists. Today, to discuss authorizations with us, we have Dr. John Awad, Medical Science Liaison, liaison with Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals. He is representing the pharmaceutical industry as an experienced medical cl and clinical affairs professional. Dr. John Awad has demonstrated history of working in the biotechnology and pharma industry with dedication to medical affairs as seen by being a board-certified medical affairs specialist. We also have Elizabeth Johnson, lead biologics coordinator with the Allergy Partners. She is representing the authorization specialist as she is the lead biologics coordinator in the largest single specialty group in the United States. She is also the CEO and principal consultant at 5015 Consulting. Elizabeth is a licensed practical nurse with a rich background in patient care and holds a certified professional coder certification. She's also a prior authorization certified specialist, exemplifying her knowledge of some of the most integral parts of the revenue cycle. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as we are continuing, we are waiting for our third panelist, um, Dr. Rafi Tashin, Assistant Clinical Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics with UCLA School of Medicine and Chief of Allergy and Immunology with Providence St. John Medical Center. He will be representing our provider as he's an expert allergist with holistic and caring approach to patient care. He specializes in immunotherapy, eczema, trigger point injections, hereditary angioedema, chronic sinus pain, and severe asthma. Thanks for the introduction, Amanda. Not a problem. Um, so we're going to be discussing the life cycle of the prescription as we have different stakeholders present. So we'll get started on just talking about the different roles that um, our current panelists have. And then when Dr. Tashin shows up, we can talk a little bit more in a discussion phase. Um, so as we talk about the prescription, there's different stakeholders that are playing different roles in the process. So the life cycle of the prescription starts with an appointment with the physician. Based on the patient's presentation, the physician can work with the patient to term, determine next steps in achieving better health with shared decision making. So as a specialty coordinator, Elizabeth, we'll start with you. Can you tell me more about your role and how you interact with providers, payers, and patients? Sure. I have a unique um, perspective from where I'm at. So I work for a large um, allergy group. We're across 20 states in the United, United States here. And I get to work with my physicians both one-on-one -on -one in conference-level settings um, as well as our individual practices. So for our specialty medications, um, primarily buy and bill, it comes through a central service. So I get to review documentation. I get to identify payer trends. So it really helps me to be able to guide my um, offices I work with and be able to guide my physicians on what's coming, what's changing, and how they can stay ahead of the game uh, with their documentation and prescription. That's fantastic. Welcome, Dr. Rafi Tashin. We already did introduction, um, but you are here now so we can talk about a few different things. Um, so for you, could you tell me what does a typical day look like for providers and how often you run into red tape with payers? It's easier to talk about when you do not run into red tape <laughs> and have a smooth day. Uh, a typical day has at least, I would say on average three authorizations of some sort that need to be done. That could take anywhere from a signature, which has been the outlier these days, to chasing something out for about three days with a few hours each day devoted to it. Um, so in that sense, it's been really frustrating. And, you know, we 
we don't have that expertise and you certainly don't go through your educational path learning that as a uh, healthcare professional, but you hope to become a simple healthcare provider, which is what I say my grandma was for me with yeah. no medical degree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that must be difficult because I find that a lot of even medical residents coming right out of medical school are struggling with the idea of payers because through medical school they aren't getting the full um, perspective of payers and their role in healthcare. So they, they understand the knowledge, they understand the clinical decision, but they don't know that payers are also playing a part in what they can and cannot prescribe. Yeah. John, can you tell me a little bit more about your role and how you interact with providers and payers? And then if you ever actually encounter patients or how you interact with providers and payers for patients. Sure. So let me first sort of explain what is a medical sense liaison and how do we fit in the scheme of the prior authorization. So the MSL job is mainly one of these like very unique positions in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries that we are the team that establish and maintain the relationships with leading physicians, researchers, clinicians, also that like they're referred to as the key opinion leaders or the thought leaders at academic and community institutions. Also, we help ensure that products are used effectively, that the medications that we are working on are served scientifically by using the resources. Also, we advise on the upcoming advances in treatments, as well as providing some inputs whenever relevant about the scientific and clinical data. So the question is, how do we fit in the scheme of the prior authorization. And please correct me if I'm wrong, Rafi and Liz, is that the MSLs usually are looked at the subject matter expert of that specific indication or that specific medication or drug or product. Even when it comes to a device or a like biopharma or even if it's a regular pharmaceutical agent. So we are the scientific source where when Dr. Tachidian or Liz needs something for a peer-to-peer, -peer, he would come to us and we would provide. And of course, through the whole like, call, I would definitely highlight how can you serve the purpose of that and make Rafi and Liz's life even easier based on our role. That's really informative. I think that in the healthcare space, we are coming from a perspective that the pharma code started to implement new rules and that really left some negative feelings in the industry. So it, instead of working as collaborate, collaborators, we're seeing more people have some hesitation of working with pharmaceutical companies and we are trying to show that the pharmaceutical company is now making positions within their rankings to show that they are an asset for their products and for a resource for different things to get approved. So Dr. Tashin, what are the non-clinical -cl non considerations that are made when picking a treatment plan? Non-clinical consideration? I mean, presuming two options are equal as far as efficacy, safety, et cetera, outcome. Oftentimes you're going for the option that's got the better support system around it, uh, the better track record for approval. And uh, I mean, I kind of am, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues, but you're trying to find the path of least resistance because frankly, with all these ludicrous obstacles that are put there simply for cost saving of some sort, which I'm oblivious to, um, it's not sustainable to continue practicing that way. And I've seen some colleagues just not do the best option, you know, standard of care or above for that reason, in that they would say, you know, the lights would have to be turned off at that point. And to me, that's a shame. And, you know, but you get squeezed, you're getting squeezed to do more. And, uh, and really have sometimes nothing to show for it except frustration from a patient 
because you got squeezed in between um, and put into a hard spot and you look bad as the professional by not coming through for them, for their ailing need. See, no one on the patient side is thinking, um, I might have a different pay or I might have a different, uh, slightly different condition or slightly different criteria than my peer or my neighbor or my cousin who's getting that treatment and how come I can't do it? So you must be inept. Yeah, that must be difficult, especially with the consumer, direct-to-consumer direct advertising. Liz, do you encounter these issues as well? I do, and sometimes I'll be in an office and the physician will come out and want to start a patient on something, and the first question is, okay, which, one, which one's going to get me, you know, the patient on therapy the quickest? And while that's not best practice, we want to make clinical decisions, um, Dr. Toshin's right. Sometimes it's, you know, in therapeutic areas, if I have three choices, which one can I get the patient on um, without delaying, especially some of these chronically ill patients? And uh, that's frustrating. Um, I'm sure that drives manufacturers <laughs> just up the wall, but that's kind of what it comes to. The volume that we see and even from enrollment forms to authorization to approval, there's so many more steps beyond that. So it, it happens. Um, it helps if you have experienced people in your office, but that's few far and in between. So being able to educate and reach out and train others to do that kind of job helps. Um, but we're, we're, there's a small number of us out there. Yeah. And John, do you see anyone, um, do you see this troubling issue in your practice? So do you have physicians expressing this to you when you speak to the professionals? So we don't deal with the uh, patients, of course, like directly like Liz and Rafi. We only deal like with the healthcare professionals and the clinical team setting. That's number one. Number two is with, when it comes to the prior authorization and the products, yes, of course, we are involved. But the involvement comes from the healthcare professionals or from the clinical team request. We don't usually communicate with the prior authorization team directly, uh, of course, for reasons that are going to come future, like, in the few, like hopefully in the next few minutes. Um, saying that, we are communicated continuously. If the product is already in the market and if it is being prescribed for prior authorization information, for the indications, the CPT codes, what are the administration routes that are acceptable, just, uh, just like what... Um, Dr. Tajidian and uh, Liz said, what are the safety and efficacy profile about the medication itself? That's extremely essential. And we provide the scientific evidence that helps the doctors and the clinical team make an informed decision. So I want to kind of piggyback off that um, and bring that kind of MSL position in because I'm lucky that I get to talk to my MSLs and my favorite thing to do, and I'm sure it drives you guys nuts, is take the PI and take a medical policy from a payer and talk to my MSLs and just ask why. Like, why is this in this one, not in this one? But the PI says this. And so it gives mm -hmm. them some homework to bring back some information. <laughs> but that helps me with an authorization because then I have a reason to fight because I have more clinical information on it. So I, I wish that everyone had access to the MSLs like that because it just helps me prepare these really wordy medical necessity letters <laughs> that um, benefit mm -hmm. me in the long run. So thanks for that. <laughs> well, this is a great point, Elizabeth. And let me tell you that we as MSLs would like to help as much as we can. And definitely patient care and the patient benefit is one of the core joys of the duty that we have on a daily basis. And being an MSL, honestly, if we're not really focused on the patient's benefit and the healthcare benefit of the patient himself or herself, that's going to be an issue that we have to talk about differently. So we are very, very, like, cooperative with that. Saying, this, saying that also, the other point is the time restraint and constraint that we have. Sometimes we're all over the place. We have territories covering West Coast, Northwest, Southwest. The time here is an issue. So it, I understand your point that having an MSL access is extremely essential, and that's why we always provide documentation. That's why we provide the medical information request form or the MRF that you get a reply on the email or using any other route that's going to be accessible to you in the future. So I totally agree with you. 
it's extremely essential. But sometimes it's beyond our own, like, timeline, the 24 hours to really, yeah. like, catch up between airports and between planes and between visits and TLL interactions that sometimes you cannot really handle the flow of communication. And if it's such a very commonly prescribed medication, that's going to be a, a real issue. And, of course, like, the, the solution is there. It's either whether to increase the number or to increase the diversity or even to increase the communication route. But still, we have to be very channeled and compliant with how we communicate with the medical teams like you and Dr. Tatujan. So it's, it's really something extremely essential to highlight here. I'm just saying why the barriers are there. But I agree with you. Thanks. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, so, Dr. Tashin, what, how, from your perspective, how quickly can you get a medication approved? Uh, on the outlier end, it's infinity because I have one that's still going on for a year <laughs> for a biologic, where the the patient has not given up. <laughs> um, we're talking about about a year. For that one but in general how long does it take i don't expect it in less than two weeks i'm pleasantly surprised at the one week mark um and oftentimes you know my 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 language has gotten dirtier and dirtier <laughs> in the last couple of years because i just start off on the offensive at this point with you know uh okay. you'd be surprised the games that are being played in fact i had one uh payers division tell me oh yeah here call this department and uh you know i double checked that was the number and it was emailed to me as well and it was actually a a home uh what do you call it a home security system number where it, wow. yeah that was the number okay. given to me to get the uh, appeal going the other i had that last week they gave me a wrong phone number it was uh yeah uh, that happens and it's frustrating yeah, and it was the same last word as the insurer's same last word or their company, which even the guy at this uh, home security service cracked up. He's like, wow, I never thought of that game being played. But the frustrating part also is you get rabbit holed into this is a pharmacy thing. You get faxes about it. After spending a day or two, it's no, this is a medical thing. Go back to the medical side. So it's a nice ping pong. Until this year, I had two to three medical assistants and or nurses chasing. And this year I took it upon myself to just see what the heck is happening. It's almost like a undercover boss. And like, are you kidding me? Like the games that are being played and the redundancies in the system and it's called the boondoggle, um, just to basically dig a hole and then refill it. You know, you do that in certain armies to keep people busy and distracted. It's just not cool, and this is where a huge need, unmet need, is is created, and and where you guys come in to, like Dr. Awad and uh, Elizabeth, to to really reverse this, and so that it's a win win win. Right now, it's a lose 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 because I can only tell you my frustration, but I have a lot of patience, so I, I got thick skin. That that's not good, you know. In the long term. It's false sense of security for the one playing games. It's a false sense of internal security or, or wellness for the patient because they're thinking, I need this medication. How come it's, they're not believing me? Now do I doubt my diagnosis? And for the healthcare team that's running around, it's like, it's hot potato. Like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, you know, they start turfing it off to their colleagues saying, do you mind chasing this authorization? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a challenge. It just takes the term care out of health care. So I call it I don't health care, you know, is, okay. is the attitude out there. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, and did you, you were mentioning that you had team members. Were they dedicated to prior authorization or it was just part of their tax? I, I don't want to subject anyone to being dedicated full-time to authors. No one wants to do that. They, they don't. <laughs> so we've tried one a day. We've tried, you know people for just these types of biologics or those types of agents. Um, we've tried every combination. Yeah, it seems like payers are just making it more difficult for everyone to process these, and it's, it's part of the problem. Yeah. What do, you, um, what do you encounter when you're 
trying to get something approved. So you have more intimate knowledge of actually processing. So what's that about and how do you handle that? You're asking me. I was asking Elizabeth. Oh, okay, okay. Good. Oh, hey, yeah. So I have the job of doing prior auth all day long. Um, so, and it, there are some days that it's just you want to beat your head against the wall. Um, and then there are days you feel like an absolute superstar because you can turn out 30 or 40 um, because you know a back line or you've gotten somebody's direct contact info or you know that there's a portal submission and you know the questions by heart. So um, those, are, those are thrilling when you can get same day approvals. But what happens in a lot of situations is you know those questions by heart um, and you get in the habit of answering them. So you go through, yeah, yeah, this patient has eczema. Yes, this patient has asthma, whatever it may be. And you check those boxes. Well, what you're opening yourself up to are audits and potential recoupment, especially when you talk about buy and bill. Um, so it really on the processing side, if you go to basics, you read the medical policy, you read the patient's chart, and you submit an authorization based on medical criteria, and you have the documentation to prove it, processing is much easier. When you are not thorough and you don't check all the boxes and you try to wiggle one in there, the process, it's just not, it doesn't happen. And the goal is these are expensive therapies. And I know it's like an unwritten thing that the goal is to deny, 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 but it kind of seems that way day in and day out. So really it, it's coming equipped and it's being able to plead your case and really, um, hope that someone listens to you and isn't just reading their prompt and checking boxes as well. Does it also apply Liz, to the uh, Oh, okay. Can, can I ask you something, Liz? So, so these yeah. boxes that you check, is it based on experience or this is based on the payer's method of peer-to-peer -peer communication? So this will even be before you get to that peer-to-peer -peer stage. This would be your initial mm -hmm. submission. And um, I each payer has their own medical policy or even, you know, pharmacy formulary for these medications. Mm -hmm. And knowing the PI and knowing the indication for that drug and what they're looking for, forwards and backwards, when you go to answer, you know, has the patient been seen in the last year? Get that from the chart. Um, has the patient had this lab drawn? Have they had this testing? Have, you know, body surface area? Um, being able to pull all that information is extremely important. And so for my role at Allergy Partners, we kind of have an internal, this drug needs this, this drug needs this. Uh, so we have kind of a cheat sheet for it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, with my doctors, I can share that information with them. And I'm mm -hmm. sure they all just love the fact that I send charts back all the time and go, sorry, I don't see it. I'm not doing this. So, um, but then that becomes education. That becomes kind of that team effort. And uh, once you have all hands on board for it and you know, we'll talk about buy and bill in a little bit where that's extremely important. Um, yeah, that's, that's the way you get it done. So, so did anybody at the MS Health before come to you with that specific, like, check boxes or the information required for that? Because that's, that's something that I'm thinking to do. Like, sometimes, no, <laughs> like I, sometimes you can have this ready. I, I've gone to lots of MSLs and been like, hey, um, so tell me why mm -hmm. this plan wants this. And... Uh, then they kind of help with that, but I've never had a proactive MSL bring me something mm -hmm. like that. That would be great if you can, if you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> have you had any um, field reimbursement managers be proactive and provide you some information like that? So I'm spoiled rotten. Let's be perfectly honest with that. My sales reps and my field reimbursement managers, uh, they know the volumes that we work at and they know what we expect and they are fantastic. I um, talked to three different people from Genentech this morning on one situation that I have. And it's like, I will connect you. I will help you. Um, I have friends that are, I have a core group of friends that are in various roles in pharmaceuticals and reimbursement managers that work with some of the drugs I work with. And they're like, hey, this change is coming, um, you know, all within compliance, but here's how you can prepare. Here's where the documentation is on our website. So um, I go back to, I'm spoiled rotten. So yes, they are very proactive with it. And that allows us to put systems in place. So in May, a major payer made a change, but someone started telling us in March. 
So we were able to have eight weeks heads up, get our patients, you know, on board, get the letters we needed. So yeah, I, I appreciate that proactiveness. Yeah, it sounds like being proactive and organized is definitely one of the ways to get authorizations approved quickly. Um, what is so when you're doing the authorizations, you can prep all you want, you can do every all everything right, but there's still a good chance of denial. So how do you deal with that? And what's your next step? So reading denial letters very carefully, because sometimes it's, uh, it's not necessarily a denial, right? It's a request for more information. It may say these services aren't approved at this time, but that's not a denial. That's not going to help get you in the step towards getting free drug for a patient um, or anything like that. So you have to read carefully. If it's truly a denial, right, read your options. If you start an appeal, does that erase your option for a peer-to-peer? Um, does an appeal take 30 days to review where a peer-to-peer takes 15 minutes to be done? So you have to look at your options. And then is it a written appeal or can you do it online via one of their portals? So take the time, look through that. And those denial letters, uh, one, make sure the phone number is correct. I had that last week. And uh, don't ever be afraid to play the I'm brand new at this or can you walk me through it? Because every payer has a little bit of a different appeal process and even going to that next level, say you've done a level one appeal and you're on your second level, don't be afraid to ask for external reviews and bring in other, um, other departments that that payer may have. Really just say, hey, help me. I really need the patient on this medication. And sometimes playing to that um, personal level or that in emotional level uh, will get you the help and assistance you need from a payer. And sometimes it definitely doesn't, but I still try that route. It's important to, to know what, what works and what doesn't. So when you have an appeal, uh, your denial letter, and let's say the, the payer comes back and says they do want a peer-to-peer, what, how mm-hmm. do you inform your physicians, Elizabeth? Uh, so scheduling peer-to-peers, especially in we're, we're heading towards the end of the year, right? Quarter four is just brutal when it comes to peer-to-peers, especially when you get around the holidays, your physicians take time off if you let them know. Um, so, and then, it, you know, your peer reviewers take time. So trying to coordinate schedules. And I never want to take away a physician's lunch hour, but if I can take, again, 15 minutes to just get that done, sometimes you have to. Uh, the peer reviewers, aren't always on the same time zone. They're not, they don't start their day at eight o'clock. So that's a game you'll play. But also when you set up a peer review, really making sure you ask, like I'm an allergy. Hey, I want an allergist, a board certified allergist to speak to my doctor to do this peer review. Um, If you don't request, you don't know what you're going to get. But that peer to peer option, as much as I hate filling my physician schedules more, especially with this type of work, and that's so much easier than appeal letters. So, sorry, sorry, physicians. Uh, we're going to do that every time that we get that option. Dr. Tashin, do you do you agree with that? That the 15 minutes for the peer to peer is a little bit more preferred than the the whole process of the appeal. Yeah, I mean, uh, unless I have a mediator, an awesome person like Elizabeth. I'm requesting a peer-to-peer right away these days, saying, let's cut to the chase, and who do I need to talk to that understands this? Um, And if it's something allergic-related, please don't give me a podiatrist that's going to review the case, you know, or OBGYN. Yeah. Do you spend a lot of time educating your, the, the person that's supposed to be your peer? Do you spend a lot of time educating them the basics before getting them to understand your side? Yes, but again... Why are we doing this when there's so much resource on the other hand that should include getting the right person who's educated already? I'm not the university all over again for someone not subspecialized on this. You know, I try to amass reference papers that say here's the evidence and that's why we're doing this. But again, you got a few cases that still break through those uh, counter and mechanisms you've set up for barriers that are there and uh that should not be the case so i mean and at some point the patients take on their their burden and say i'm gonna go raise hell with the uh whoever the obstructor is so 
Yeah. You know, and, it's, and I'm sure it comes back to you on the, the patient end where the patient just seems frustrated with the yeah, process. Exactly. John, do you have um, experience with being possibly a mediator with peer-to-peer -peer or interacting with a physician in that area? So MSLs usually do not mediate the prior authorization communications for multiple reasons. The first one, of course, is being this is a very specific patient-focused communication where probably a name is going to slip here or there, some HIPAA issues can come up. So MSLs are not really obliged. We're not even like able to be exposed to that amount of information. So it's not recommended from the MSL perspective to attend the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, calls. That's number one for compliance reasons and for HIPAA violations reasons. Number two is we're not even able to guide the doctor where should he prescribe the medication or what should he do with this specific case and the peer-to-peer -peer authorization or the peer-to-peer -peer call since it is a very specific patient-focused communication. We can only provide the scientific support, the evidence, whatever information is needed to the healthcare professional or the clinical team and then they will take it over to the peer-to-peer um, communication. Do I have experience with that or not? I used to be a physician here in Pennsylvania for almost a couple of years and I did the peer-to-peer -peer reviews. I know what Dr. Uh, Tan Jian is talking about. It's a pain. <clears throat> and I totally appreciate also what Liz is doing for the patients. It, they make it very frustrating sometimes. Um, it's just about having the information ready in time. This is the, this is the key point. And our MSL position really has to be very focused on what does the doctor need and to be timely on that. How we do it is basically we get a request from a doctor or from the clinical team through the physician, okay? And that's maybe the, 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 the trick here is always put the doctor in the um, copy or in the communication panel with the MSL. And then you're going to be like having this pop up and reply back. We can provide you with the medical information request form. We can provide you with whatever standard review documents that we have. We can provide with whatever label, uh, on label indications based on the FDA approval of the medication. And if there's any further questions, we can answer it based on the compliant, reactive, or even um, answering methods. That's number one. Number two as well is we provide a multiple resources. So suppose that we work with like specialty X and there's a, this orphan disease that we're dealing with. The MSL job is also to find what other resources can the doctor or the clinical team use to find information easier. Like how can he find competitive information? What other choices do, do they have for the patients? What other options? What are the, the HEOR differences. So all these are data that we can be there to support and we should also be there to support with as a medical affairs team as an MSL. So we do not really attend the prior authorization, but we are the back supporters of all the teams that are involved in the peer-to-peer -peer and the prior authorization um, scheme. So if there is an issue that they are trying to get something approved and need the supporting documentation, you are the resource to find that supporting documentation mm -hmm. to increase the approval, the chance of getting the approval based on clinical evidence and support. You are the resource for and the medical information. Exactly. And, and just what, what Liz was saying earlier is that the appeals or the denials, if you find an appeal due to a reason or one of these evidence that they do not know or they're searching for, please come to the NSL. Ask them, do you have any evidence for that? And it's our job to find out whether we have it or not. Of course, our goal is to provide evidence. Our goal compliantly is not to push approval for the medication. This is based on the physician's discretion and the clinical team discretion. But our job is to provide the evidence if it exists and according to the request of the doctor. So yes, of course, we, we do have the ability and if there's an appeal or a denial, please, of course, like, go ahead with the MSL, and this is one of our core jobs to do that. My time on PubMed is going to get a lot shorter because I'm just going to go to the MSL and ask for articles and studies from now on. So thanks. It's a well, good tip. 
<laughs> of course. And, as we're and, and this about, idea of check boxes is really great, Liz. Like, honestly speaking, I'm just thinking about that. We did it before, but not in the North American region. I worked in the Middle East, North Africa region before. And we used to have these check boxes that if you're going to get approval, get approval for this medication, you better collect this amount of information. And it was really helpful sometimes, but every system has its own way and dynamic of working. So I didn't see that here in the years that I'm practicing in the United States, but it would be great if that's a common practice to have. Yeah. So, Liz, as we're talking about specialty medications, this is your, your area, and I'm sure Dr. Dr. Passion also experiences this. How does the buy and build process work in the office, and what's the workflow like? So this is my favorite part of all this. Um, buy and bill across any specialty is, it, you theoretically follow the same steps, right? You're buying a drug, you're giving it, and you're billing for it. Now, there's a thousand moving pieces to that core step, right? Um, and so in an office that I work with, it's very much, we spend a lot of time on the pre-service review. So that includes your authorization, but looking at what type of uh, coverage they have. Are they copay card eligible? Are they grant eligible? Um, then talking to manufacturers. Uh, do they have maybe a um, drug uh, supply that I can get while I'm working on a prior off to get a patient started? So looking at all the pieces beforehand, looking at um, my fee schedules. How much am I going to get paid if I give this drug? Is it enough to cover uh, the cost of that drug? So making a buy and build decision Obviously, your first step is clinical. The doctor wants this medication. Second, it's can I affordably deliver it to the patient that the patient can affordably pay for? So is cost appropriate on both sides? Um, so once you have those pieces in place, that's when you can really start to grow a buy and bill program or utilize that for acquisition. And there are some patients' plans that that's not possible. It is a specialty pharmacy carve out. It has to go to a pharmacy. So you need to also be able to know those payers and not try to buy and bill for them because you're not going to get paid. Um, and then making sure that you have an inventory management system that allows you to separate buy and bill from your specialty so that it doesn't grow legs and walk away or get given to the wrong patient and not billed for. Um, it also helps to have some experience and some knowledge on coding and how um, these indications selecting the appropriate diagnosis code for that drug because you'll catch hiccups there. Um, a lot of times we see that in asthma, right? You've got moderate, you know, to severe asthma for a lot of these biologics, but they add that 0.41 or 0.51 after the um, diagnosis code, which signifies they're having an exacerbation. Well, it says in the PI that this is not for use in exacerbations. So times uh, insurance companies will deny. So really paying attention to your coding and then having someone dedicated to watch your reimbursement, making sure that claims pay correctly. While prior authorizations are super frustrating on the front end, on the back end, if you have issues with the claim, it's just as frustrating because you feel like you fought twice then to get it and then now to get paid for it. Um, buy and bill is a great way to look at getting paid. Uh, you know, you're getting paid for your time. Um, sometimes it's faster to get buy and bill drug in the office than to go through a specialty pharmacy. So you've reduced that time you've spent uh, working on that process. As well as when you purchase directly from a distributor, it's getting shipped, it's coming to you next day, day after. Um, sometimes with the pharmacies, they don't always ship when they tell you, so you don't have drug in office for patients. Um, so in buy and bill working, your scheduling and your communication with your patient is the next part of that. So there's, I mean, I could talk about this for an entire hour, but um, those are some of the key highlights to buy and bill and um, having that provider backing that knowing that when they select that drug for that, uh, that there's that many things to go through to actually get it in the office, uh, that provider patience and support is super important. Yeah, that's really good advice about specialty and buy and bill. That really helps everyone understand all the complications. Dr. Tashin, do you see that there, it, do you have similar perspective as Elizabeth on buy and bill? And do you have um, 
symptoms. Is there any risk for you to do Bindville as a physician? Yeah, so uh, in general, for a physician in my position, in my position you do one bad buying bill, you, you know, to make it up, you probably need another 15 to 20, 25 correct ones just to cover for a mistake that might have been uh, overseen by someone who doesn't have Elizabeth's expertise, right? Yeah. In either pre checking, pre authorizing, um, putting the right codes in, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, okay. I've not tinkered with it. Um, I know a bunch of my colleagues do it. And they have a dedicated person or outsourced uh, entity that's helping them with this because it's not for the faint of heart. Okay. And uh, I'll tell you, even some universities stay away from it because okay. they risk losing their shirt my, in it. So, yeah, I, at this time, I don't do it, but you know, I've, I've considered with the right help to do it. Yeah, it seems like there's some risk involved with trying to make sure that you're not losing money on the, the product and making sure that the patient still gets it. Um, Liz, do you see that there are issues with, when it comes to buy and bill, what are some of the challenges that you face with, other than you already said? So is there anything with like, besides just the, you mentioned inventory challenges, what's, what's going on there? What is the struggle with that? So I'll, I'll back up a little bit and kind of explain one challenge that's very common that Dr. Tashton touched on earlier is the pharmacy versus medical benefit. And I think anyone who deals with specialty medications uh, should truly understand um, what the difference is because I can get a pharmacy benefit approval in a day or two. Um, then I have to set up shipment with a pharmacy and so on. Medical benefit authorizations, they typically have to be reviewed by a nurse reviewer, a physician reviewer. They take longer. Um, some plans, when you submit what's called a predetermination, it's a written request, they can take up to 45 days to review that documentation. So time, right? Time is your first big factor. Um, and time then can segue into this inventory because if you order drugs for a patient and you don't have an authorization approved, that's money sitting in your refrigerator. You're just, I mean, thousands of dollars can sit there. And so you really need to make sure before you spend a penny on a drug, that you have an approval. Patients, if they're copay card eligible, have gotten their copay assistance or you've gotten them assistance through grants or whatever it may be, and that the patient's committed. So I firmly believe in patients involved in their healthcare. Um, so on the copay card side, I like to have patients call and request that and then call me and let me know they've gotten that set up. Because what that shows to me is that I'm going out on a limb, I'm gonna buy this drug, I'm gonna have it, and that patient's involved. They're gonna come, they're going to work on whatever their, you know, diagnosis is, and we're in it together. It's a team approach. Um, and when they come, we talk about it. We talk about the education of, you know, your EOB may come in the mail. What is an EOB? Why does it have so much money on it? Um, and it, you kind of set the standard that I'm here for you. I'm going to work on this. And your patients usually are a little more compliant with therapy, not just, you know, clinically, but also they're invested emotionally. Yeah, that's a good point about, um, just being invested. Patients need to be invested, especially if the medications are five figures um, mm -hmm. every time they get it. It's, it's a lot, and they need to be invested in the total cost. Um, so with patients, do you help them help you with the renewing of authorizations? Do you guys um, encourage them to keep it on their calendar as well so that they know that they have an authorization if they have another refill that they need? I don't. Um, I, so we use spreadsheets and various other support systems um, using our EMR. Um, we have the ability to put pop-ups or things that come up in EMR. Um, PA expires this date. We put the ID number that we got it approved under because what if your insurance changes? Um, so we put it every place that everyone on the team from practice managers, physicians, the front desk staff can see that so it's transparent and we can continue that conversation. So what we do on these master spreadsheets that we have for each one of our offices, we have that expiration date listed and we go through a month in advance. Um, I have a wonderful team member who does that. She organizes it for us and um, goes through and says, okay, these are all of your August. These are all of your September. And then we divide and conquer. And through that, if a patient is non-compliant, uh, we reach out and have our offices get in touch with that patient. Um, 
and if a patient stopped, you know, we can cross that one off the list. But it really takes organization and it takes all kinds of, you know, just tracking and following. So how much time do you think that you spend just tracking renewals or your team tracks renewals? A lot? <laughs> I, I, could have asked, I could have asked Becky and she could have told me. Um, so it, it takes several hours to just go through each one of these. And then every time we order drug for a patient, um, every time we are checking copay cards, we're looking at that. So our eyes probably look at those expiration dates, I'm going to guess, every single day. Um, and, you know, with COVID and a lot of people losing jobs or being furloughed, it's even more essential to, on the front side, be checking eligibility, making sure that if they got COBRA or their ID number changed, they got, you know, a marketplace plan, making sure we have coverage for them in that, in that time. So we're looking at them pretty frequently, daily, hourly, something like that. Dr. Tashin, do you, do you see any of the renewal authorizations? Do you spend time on it or do your staff? Or do you have someone like Liz doing that for you? So this year, it's been uh, a shocking amount of reauthorizations that have been more dental, like endodontist-like, like pulling teeth in other words, than simple prior offs in past years. And I realize there's a lot of expenses due to COVID and all this stuff, but like, why are we suffering just because another part of healthcare is uh has ex extended expenditures right exceeded their expenditures it's almost like trying to cover rn is what it feels like you know punishing the necessary offs and really the reauthorizations because it's a year later or two years later it's that yearly annual renewal that's become another just uh, disaster where you want to pull your hair out um and again like i said i the first line i tell people on the other line now is like i'm not ready to quit or retire so let's do this but it shouldn't be that way <laughs> yeah. dr tashton are you guys seeing out your way so i know over here um some of the plans have changed from six months to a year authorization they've dropped them down to three months and so it's not necessarily a yearly renewal right we're we're fighting that every three to six months but what's hard is not every patient comes back in that time frame. Not every disease state requires monthly follow-ups, let alone a payer pay for an office visit that often. So, you know, Quad AI, you know, put out new guidelines for severe asthma, encouraging us to see patients every three to six months. Well, that's great. I'm going to have that record, but not always. And some patients don't want to come back. You know, right now, our patients coming in? Is telemedicine, is that going to support enough? Are we documenting enough about these biologics? There's so many what if factors right now when it's going to come to these short, shorter renewal times. Um, so T TBD on those. Yeah. I imagine telemedicine would be another conversation, another webinar full. Uh, but we do have a yeah. question from our attendees. So we have a question where it says, um, my physicians think it is a hassle to call insurance to try and request the peer to peer. Do you have tips on how to request a peer to peer? This person's currently getting the runaround and not actually having the payers agree to a peer-to-peer. -peer. So how do, you, how do you go about getting that? So I'll jump on this one. So my first uh, answer would be in those denial letters that are like six pages long, go all the way through, and usually towards the end, um, it'll talk about, it'll give a phone number to call directly to a peer-to-peer -peer line. Um, and if that option's not given, when you call that insurance company, and again, I know this is a phone call, um, ask for either utilization management or in the prompts that may say pre-certification or pre-authorization. Go to one or two of those departments and say, hey, I have to schedule a peer-to-peer -peer review. Um, can you warm transfer me? Don't give me their number. Don't hang up on me, but warm transfer me where they go and get another person on the other line and connect that phone call so that they, you can make that schedule or you can set that up without playing the phone game. So warm transfer best advice I can give. Thank you. So uh, to wrap it up, Dr. Rafi Passion, what is one thing you want attendees to take away from them with them after today's discussion? Well, one thing would be to really mm -hmm. like the optimize the system. So when you're going into it, if you're deciding to buy and build, get the right 
people the right help, right? To, to have it, an awesome, impermeable team. If you're doing this on your own with uh, just authorizations, I guess, again, consult with the experts, which you have here. Um, and then don't give up. <laughs> it's too easy to give up. Yeah, that's great advice. Don't give up. Elizabeth, what about you? What are your final thoughts? Um, I have a lot, <laughs> but uh, this is truly, it's truly a space that we're all in the trenches together, right? We're all fighting for the same cause, and that's to get patients on therapy. So make connections with people, phone a friend. And I know it's kind of hard, but like Amanda, like we have on LinkedIn, right? Hey, we're in the same role. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about our struggles and our successes. And for example, I see Amber on here, who's one of my friends that while we're not in the same specialty, reach out, ask questions. Have you seen this? Can you tell me more about this drug? Um, and if not, go to your manufacturers, really rely on your field reimbursement managers. That's what they're there for. And while they, you know, they can't help you on every drug, they can help you on that one. Um, really lean on them. Really make sure that they understand what your needs are and what your skill level is. If you're brand new to authorizations, absolutely brand new, a lot of times they can make peer connections for you. And this office, you know, maybe they'll be willing to talk to you. Um, and that's how you can kind of build that network. Um, there hopefully will be more educational resources coming um, one of these days because it's we're all fighting alone, it feels like, but there's so many people out there doing the same thing. And if you keep the right mentality, again, it's about the patient. Um, we'll, we'll all get through it. And don't be afraid to, you know, make your providers do peer-to-peers. Sorry, Dr. Toshin. <laughs> <laughs> and John, what about you? What are your final thoughts? So my final thoughts is, of course, like, don't hesitate to, like, ask for the MSL advice don't hesitate to ask for the msl information that we can provide and most of all ask us what can we do who should we communicate with there's a lot of teams inside the like medical affairs and there's a lot of teams inside the manufacturer that can provide information including the market access the sales team the reimbursement managers just like ask us where should we go if there's any questions needed also please provide some time so it's always very good if we know that there's something a couple of weeks, maybe a month ahead. But if somebody calls me, hey, John, you know what? We need this, this, and that by tomorrow. All right, that's a challenge. That's not going to be feasible for the teams because there's a flow. Again, if it's not an orphan disease product, if it's not something that is uh, really uncommon, that is, then it's described on a daily basis and the prior authorizations can take time and our teams as well are overwhelmed. So we understand the challenge. We're supporting, let's work on this together. So this is just my two cents that I would love to give at the end. Thank you. So we have one question that I'm just gonna briefly mention here. Um, they asked if we like cover, our med, cover My Meds. And I would say that we all use some kind of technology solution in some capacity, and there are always solution, technology solutions coming out and available. So. Um, we do think that, I would say, I believe that technology solutions are where prior authorizations are headed, and integrating it into technology is really important um, if we're going to move together as an industry. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And um, I think Cover My Meds is fantastic for pharmacy benefit, um, especially because they're integrated with so many, like, you know, Epic and all the different systems. Um, I think that on the medical benefit side, because of that medical review and the predeterminations having to be written submissions, I think that uh, that's a whole different ballgame. And I, I would love to see something come along <laughs> that would service the needs of uh, bringing in the advanced benefit determinations from federal, right? Like there's, there's so many different pre-service reviews. Um, whoever gets that going first, they'll retire very well. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you for, to our speakers, Dr. Rafi Tashin, Dr. John Awad, and Elizabeth Johnson for speaking today and helping us to understand this topic a bit more. Uh, to find out more information about prior authorization or the challenges of reimbursement, please visit priorauthtraining.org. Uh, this webinar will be made available online shortly. 
on PriorAuthTraining.org or on LinkedIn at Prior Authorization, the National Board of Prior Authorization Specialists. Our next webinar will be September 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.